Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. Hey, it was the first time I got that right without stuttering. Um, I am your host, your sensei, your teacher, Nicholas Tyson. Um, and today we are going to be talking about probably the seminal work of Japanese literature, like bar none. If there is literally any takeaway from this course or any Japanese literature course for that matter, then it should be this text. And we are, of course, talking about the Tale of Genji, the Genji Monogatari. So let's go into our screen share so you can all see our notes for today. All right. So the the tale of genji is an is an interesting one the way we have it now is it exists in uh you know a whole bunch of chapters and it's 47 i should actually know that <laughs> but i don't know off the top of my head it's it's weird how i don't know how many chapters there are in the tale of genji off the top of my head but there's a lot it's 52 52 chapters well anyway anyway the the tale of genji is sort of roughly broken down into two parts nowadays there are the parts that actually involve the titular character genji um so there's all the chapters up until his death spoilers he dies you probably figured that one out <laughs> he had to die at some point <laughs> he, he couldn't have lived forever um and then the sort of latter so that's about two-thirds of the work and then the latter third deals with the the generation of his grandson um, and focuses on two characters named Kaoru and uh, Niol. But we're not going to be talking about them, even though it includes one of my favorite chapters of the text, because I want to focus on sort of what is like quintessentially the Genji. Um, the text, though, when it was disseminated in the 11th century, wasn't really disseminated as a whole thing. Um, mostly they would have read individual chapters or even parts of chapters that would have been circulated by hand, like in handwritten manuscripts, amongst a fairly limited group of aristocrats. This is not something that would have been widely known. And it really, and even though the Genji in later periods, in fact, actually fairly shortly after um, Murasaki's death became sort of a quintessential um, work of Japanese literature, at the time she was, she had gained some notoriety, but um, she was in many ways sort of one of many, and it was really after her death that she achieved the, the level of fame that we now associate with her and with this text. So her name is actually kind of strange, or this, her name as we know it is kind of strange. Um, it's not her given name at all. The, the, so this, it even sort of looks like a Japanese name. You have what looks like a Japanese surname, Murasaki, and you have what looks like maybe possibly could be a Japanese given name, although it's not. So Murasaki is its a name of a plant. It's also the name of a character in the novel, which is a cause of great confusion. <laughs> um, and then Shikibu, that term is actually a title. It comes from the, the title her father probably had when he was in the Ministry of Ceremonies. And the name Murasaki that makes up what appears to be the family name, it's not really a family name, actually probably comes from the character in the tale of genji named murasaki now there there are alternative theories of how she acquired this name i'm not i don't know to me the most convincing one is the fact that actually she herself is named or what we call her is named after this character in the genji her actual given name um hard to know um it's we do know that she as i have right here that she was uh, Fujiwara. She was specifically from the branch of the Fujiwara family from which um, a number of um, imperial regions came. So not necessarily people who were in the imperial line of succession. Well, they would have eventually been in the imperial line of succession. So the way the regency worked is that essentially there were a number of times when um, children would have ascended to the, th to the imperial throne. And in their capacity, they weren't necessarily allowed to rule in their own right, especially if they weren't of age. Um, it's worth noting that at this time in, Jap in Japanese history, um, you wouldn't really be age of majority until you were at least 12. Yeah, so you, so you would ascend into quote-unquote adulthood at the age of 12. The, there's a formal ceremony that um, accompanied this known as um, the putting on of the trousers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you actually see that in the first chapter of the Genji. When Genji comes of age, there's this huge elaborate ceremony about putting on pants. You know, each, each culture has its own thing. Um, and then the regents would then rule in the, um, 
the sort of the young emperor's stead while they were still a child, while they were still technically, and even oftentimes after they came of age, because they would be regarded as sort of like important advisors. Oftentimes then these regents would marry their daughters to said emperor, thus sort of like them becoming uh, the grandparent of an emperor. And so there is a lot of in intermingling between this particular branch of the Fujiwara family and the imperial line. Um, Murasaki is sort of outside of that sort of entanglement, but still of the same part of the family. Um, fairly early in her adolescence, not actually not early in her adolescence, actually at a fairly young age, even prior to her, what we would consider adolescence, she was married to um, another member of a different branch of the Fujiwara family, uh, Fujiwara no Nobutaka, with whom she had one son. And pretty shortly after having this son, um, her husband died. And it was after the death of her husband. And you see this right here. Shortly after her husband's death, possibly to console herself for her husband's death. It's not exactly known what she thought of her husband, but possibly out of grief for her husband and in consolation for her, his death, she began to write what would later be known as the tale of Genji. In other words, she began to write the story, some of the stories and chapters and vignettes that would be included later in the total thing that we call the Genji Monogatari. Um, as a result of the, the first few chapters or bits that were disseminated around, you know, various prominent members of the imperial court, she actually gained quite a bit of notoriety and actually was brought into service to, she was a lady in waiting to the Empress Shoshi. Um, I'll talk a little bit about her relationship with Shoshi in a second. Um, what's interesting about Murasaki in terms of her early life is that she was in many ways much like one of Genji's favorites. In other words, her relationship to her father, people presume, was very similar to the way in which Genji treated the character known as Murasaki in the text. In other words, thought of as sort of like someone to like bring up in a particular way with all manners of refinement and education and so forth. Um, unlike the Murasaki in the text, <laughs> um, the author probably was not in a sexual um, relationship with her dad. I'm, I can say that with a fair degree of certainty. Um, but what's important here is to note that, so she was much beloved by her father and also very, very highly educated, much more so than even a woman of this time would have been. I mean, I talked about this before that sort of this is a period in which women's writing really becomes a thing, like writing by women um, and women gain prominence as a result of their ability to write poetry, to write prose, et cetera. And in many ways, Murasaki is sort of indicative of that. But she was even more well-educated than, like, even the most, like, literate women of her class. Uh, so much so that, so her knowledge of, especially Chinese literature, was so, at least for, amongst the people in court, was so good that she actually taught Chinese to the empress. So when she was brought into Shoshi's service, she actually taught her Chinese. And Murasaki's love of Chinese literature and her knowledge of it can be seen throughout the text. She constantly refers to it. Um, the most consistent reference you see throughout the text, and the one that you actually see in your reading for this week, is um, to this right here. So we're talking primarily about, you know, like Tang Dynasty literature. And so for for someone like Murasaki and also for many other people at court, the real touchstone would be someone like um, Bai Juyi. And the um, Song of Everlasting Sorrow, please don't make me pronounce this in Chinese, especially in classical Chinese, because I'm, I'm going to screw it up and you guys will hate me for it. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the long, the long re re regret song, um, this is usually translated into English as the Song of Everlasting Sorrow or sometimes as the Song of Everlasting Regret, um, which is a fairly long like it's like 115 lines, a fairly long narrative poem by Baiji about, which is sort of a fictionalization of the historical story of the relationship between the Emperor Xuanzang, um, who in the poem is only ever referred to as the Han Emperor, um, the Emperor Xuanzang and um, Yang Guifei, who is this sort of, you know, this beautiful woman that the Emperor becomes infatuated with. And as a result of his infatuation with this woman, um, the country is sort of led into ruin and 
at least <laughs> at that po- at that point was thought to have been responsible for the rebellion of Anlushan, um, which is a city in ancient China. I can't remember what Anlushan is called now. I really don't. Again, Chinese, like, I know a little bit about Chinese history and, and Chinese literature, enough to study Japanese literature, not enough to actually be a scholar of Chinese literature and history myself. Anyway, so, but the important point to note is that is sort of the the general, like, moral of that of that story, which is that the emperor becomes so obsessed with his desires for this beautiful young woman that he sort of abandons his duties and his purpose in the world. As for the the tale of Genji itself, is it in many ways sort of the ultimate monogatari? It culminates all of those sort of various threads that I talked about last week in terms of how prose fiction developed in the Heian period. Um, as I noted, uh, the Genji is regarded as the work of classical Japanese literature and is more representative of a certain like ideology of what Japanese literature is supposed to be than really any other. Um, and it also brings together all those disparate f- threads that we saw, like, say, in the Issei Monogatari. So in the Issei Monogatari's sort of obsession with, like, poetry and sort of the, the prose that explains it, but then also, like, specifically poems about romantic relationships and their entanglements. Um, you will see elements from the Takatori Monogatari, especially sort of like the more supernatural and fantastical elements that that's in here, too. And also we see elements of something like um, the sort of the, da- the daily records, the so-called Nikki, um, in that, and I wish there were an example of this in your reading for today, but it was just wasn't exerted. I would have had to like go look for a separate, different chapter myself, and I wasn't going to do that, especially since like the Genji's long, the chapters are long, and I think the excerpts will help you sort of stay on track and, and comprehend what's going on far better than if I had just like plucked out an entire chapter or two wholesale. Anyway, she does make reference throughout the text of about concerning herself as an author and her um, ability to faithfully record what she herself understood. So there is this sense in the text of this isn't just like, I mean, everyone would have known that it was fiction because, you know, the people at court reading this would have known that these people never actually existed. But the, the text maintains this pretense of being like a historical record. But in the same way that, um, excuse me, that the sort of monogatari were more highly, especially like something like the Takatori monogatari, in fact, is actually referred to in the Genji at one point in the chapter you guys don't read. Um, The reason why monogatari were more highly valued by the people who lived at court than even these sort of accurate historical records <clears throat> was because of the way in which it dealt with the full range of human experience. And in many ways, that is the, that is the thing that Murasaki picks up from this tradition. It is a very sort of psychologically focused novel. Um, the what that happens in the text can often be pretty boring. There's not a lot of action. <laughs> it's mostly a lot of sitting around talking or like embarrassing women into having sex with you. But in that way, in the fact that we're talking about a leisured class, so they're not going to be doing, a whole, there's not going to be any like grand battles or anything like that, but it's definitely going to be focused on their like thoughts, their feelings, and their, their relationships with each other. All right, so let's, uh, so I'm going to divide this up into two videos. So in this first part, we have, you know, the, the introduction, and then I'm also going to talk about the very first chapter. In the second video, for various reasons, I will talk about the Aoi chapter, and I'll get to that, you know, when that comes up. So in this first chapter, um, usually translated as the Paulonia court, Paulonia is a kind of tree, it's a Paulonia tree. Um, that's a translation of the Japanese title, Kiritsubo. Um, now what's complicated about this, and this is sort of, com- it's a complication for all of the female char- characters in the text. The, the, fe- the women characters in the text don't ever have names. They never have given names. They're always referred to either by their position in in society by their relationship to someone else so like the daughter of etc 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 wife of etc 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 or by some sort of almost like you could say lyrical designation and so um kiritsubo is known as kiritsubo which is actually a place in the imperial palace it's a pavilion 
in the imperial palace um, with, that is surrounded by polonia trees. And so she is the woman who lives in the pavilion that is surrounded by polonia trees. And so that's why she's known as Kiritsubo. And I will generally refer to her as Kiritsubo. This is Genji's mother. Um, before we get into the actual like story, why do I why did I have a two there? Should be a two there. I'm gonna, let's erase that real quick. Okay, I don't know. Some random. I must have hit enter accidentally at some point. So I want to take a look at the Japanese text for a bit. I realize you guys are not necessarily Japanese speakers, and then especially since this is classical Japanese, you're probably going to be even if you are a Japanese speaker, you're probably going to still be a little lost. So. What's interesting about the the Genji, and this is not really well represented in Sidon Sticker's translation, he, he has at the beginning, in a certain reign, there was a lady not of the first rank whom the emperor loved more than any of the others. Um, that's not really how the Genji begins. The Genji actually begins with a question. Um, you can see it right here. Izure no on toki ni ka. So, so this ka here is the same as in modern Japanese. This is what makes it a question. The ni here, so on toki. So in what, literally it says in which reign, izure no on toki, in which imperial reign was it? And then there's an implied was it. In, you know, in which imperial reign <clears throat> did, you know, the emperor love a particular woman more than all the other, you know, ladies at court? And I point this out because um, even though Murasaki doesn't use that the exact sort of formulaic e expression that we saw before, this use of the term mukash um, that was in both the Ise Monogatari and in the uh, Takatori Monogatari, both the Tales from Ise and the Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. Excuse me for a sec. I need to keep my throat nice and moist. <clears throat> she still is alluding to, the, by having this sort of like, thought about the past and sort of specifically framing the beginning of the tale as something that happens in the past. She is still looking back to a sort of an earlier, more glorious age in the way that those other monogatari did. And in many ways, sort of the entire first paragraph, at least the first paragraph in Sidon Sticker's translation, in reality, in the, in the Japanese text actually these first three paragraphs are all one unit. I don't know why Side Sticker broke it up this way. He just did. Anyway, let's look at this first paragraph in his text. In a certain reign, there was a lady not of the first rank, whom the emperor loved more than any of the others. The grand ladies with high ambitions thought her a presumptuous upstart, and lesser ladies were still more resentful. Everything she did offended someone. Probably aware of what was happening, she fell seriously ill and came to spend more time at home than at court. The emperor's pity and affection quite passed bounds. No longer caring what his ladies and courtiers might say, he behaved as if intent upon stirring gossip. So here again, already we see sort of the the way, and it's actually mentioned in the next paragraph. His court looked at with very uh, looked with very great misgiving upon what seemed a reckless infatuation. In China, just such an unreasoning passion had been the undoing of an emperor. That's the Emperor Xuanzang and had spread turmoil throughout the land. As the resentment grew, the example of young Guifei was the one most frequently cited against a lady. So here, she's being set up as this sort of like beauty that the, the emperor becomes obsessed with and then everything goes to pot as a result. That doesn't actually happen in this text. You know, the, the, there's no rebellion. The nation state doesn't fall apart as a result, but sort of the way in which like one's desires and passions distract you from what you're supposed to be doing with your life like that aspect of the story is definitely in play here so i want to talk about what i think is an important feature of this text and what sort of distinguishes it in many ways from other japanese contemporaneous japanese texts and just, you know, makes it a better, you know, literary document. <laughs> um, this is the way in which, like, Murasaki uses doubling throughout the text. In other words, it's not just that, you know, there are these allusions to Chinese literature. There are these, like, patterns that keep repeating over and over and again in the text in which sort of, like, particular, like, women come to rep resemble other women. Certain events come to rep represent other events. You have, like, this this concept of the, the karmic bond. And anyway, so... The, I think the first and sort of pro probably primary doubling is this literary relationship between the tale of Genji and Baijuyi's poem. 
And in fact, the whole opening chapter is in many ways a kind of echo of the first line of Baijiu's poem. And I have it here in the Chinese, and I'll, I'll break this down for those of you who don't speak Chinese. So you have the, the Han emperor uh, thought a whole lot about his, his that literally says color. Um, color here is a euphemism for sexy time, essentially. So he thought a whole lot about the, like his dalliances and the people who he wanted to be having sexy time with. And there's an implied and ruined the country. So the way I translated this is the Han emperor thought so highly of his romances that he brought the nation to ruin. Um, this is this is just an incredibly dense line in Chinese. It's it's very hard to translate because there's just so much going on there. Um, but that's the basic gist. So the Han emperor in this case is the emperor Xuanzang, but he's only like I said, he's only really called the the Han emperor. And not just with Genji, but sort of many of the prominent men in the story sort of fall into the, this pattern. And so, so that like each man, oftentimes it's sometimes it's the emperor, sometimes it's Genji. In fact, it's usually Genji who screws himself over in so many ways, um, becomes a, another kind of Xuanzang. And then the, the women that they become involved with become sort of an alternative young Guifei. Now, what's interesting about this is that sort of um, in many, both historically and kind of in the poem, I think Baiji actually has more sympathy for her than sort of history did at the time. But Yang Guifei is sometimes cast as a bit of a villain, or not even a villain, but kind of like a temptress. Um, but this book definitely, this tale, so the tale of Genji, definitely wants to tell the story of th that kind of woman from her perspective. Um, I'll get into this in a bit when we talk about is this really about Genji. So, but so, but that's the first primary um, doubling is sort of the relationship between the, um, this text and this sort of older Tang Dynasty poem. Um, the other important doubling that you see in the text, and this is one that you see throughout, is the way in which women who appear earlier in the text start to figure for women who appear later in the text. Um, sort of the primary one is not even really a doubling. It's more like a, it's more like sort of a series of doubles. You have like Kiritsubo to Fujitsubo and then later to Murasaki. So Kiritsubo is Genji's mother. And so she's the, she is the prototype. She sort of sets the standard for a woman in this text and sort of every other woman who follows in many ways is sort of to be understood not necessarily as a function of her, but in relationship to her. You sort of see the similarities and the differences as a result of this first woman you see in the text who is Genji's mom. Um, and then you have, after Genji's mom, the, the next favorite of the, the same emperor, who is Genji's dad, um, is this young woman, um, Fujitsubo, who's probably in her like late teens when she um, becomes the emperor's wife and gives birth to a crown prince, a later crown prince. So this is a current crown prince who is the son of this woman, the Kokiden consort. And again, so these are, again, these names are mostly places. So the Kiritsubo is the Polonia pavilion, the Fujitsubo is the Wisteria pavilion. The, the Kokiden is a, it's a hall <laughs> in the Imperial Palace. Um, Rokujo, which is later, a lady we'll see later, literally means Sixth Avenue. So she's the lady who lives on Sixth Avenue. Yeah, so these are not the, and then Aoi is the name of a plant. <laughs> it's, the, it's just the way it is. So Fujitsubo is an interesting character though. Um, so a little aside or just an anecdote, personal anecdote. Um, I was once made fun of at a dinner party for saying that Fujitsubo is my favorite character in the Genji. Um, it's interesting that at the time, I didn't even really have a favorite character in the Genji. I just sort of like thought, picked a, someone off the top of my head. I was like, ah, oh, Fujitsubo is fine, I guess. <laughs> um, but actually, as I, uh, so I used to, so I have taught the, the Genji in its entirety in courses before. And I definitely, actually, I think Fujitsubo is actually my favorite character, but for reasons that appear in later chapters, not necessarily in this one. So let's look for page 307. Now, what's interesting about when she first appears on the scene is not just that she is like a favorite, like um, Genji's mom, Kiritsubo, was, but also because the, the whole reason that he becomes infatuated with her in the first place was because she looks like Kiritsubo. Um, hoping that, and so this is starting right here, hoping that she, which is, uh, uh, in this case, uh, who is it? 
who is the she here? She said, I don't know if seen anyone, but I'm not. Uh, oh, it's a, one of the other princes. Okay, it's a princess. All right. Might be right. Just uh, so someone who's recommending her to the emperor. The emperor asked most courteously to have the princess sent to court. Her mother was reluctant and even fearful, however. One must remember, she said, that the mother of the crown prince was a most willful lady who had subjected the cutie to the lady to open insults and presently sent her into a fatal decline. So we saw this relationship before where the, the cookie den consort, the mother of the current crown prince fearing just jealous of this woman, but also I think rightly fearing that her, that Kiritsubo's son, which is Genji would supplant her own son as crown prince because everybody loves Genji. It's like a, it's like a golden child. <laughs> um, so she, she rightly fears this and sort of, but then does a lot of shitty things to um, Kiritsubo as a result. And so, yeah, you know, Fujitsubo's mom is afraid <laughs> and rightly, before she made up her mind, she followed her husband in death, and the daughter was alone. The emperor renewed his petition. He said that he would treat the girl as one of his own daughters. This whole thing about, like, women who are treated like daughters, but then later become lovers. It's, I don't know. I, I never know what to make of this. Her attendants and her maternal relatives and her older brother, Prince Hyobu, um, consulted together and concluded that rather than languish at home, she might seek consolation at court, and so she was sent off. She was called Fujitsubo. The resemblance to the dead lady, which is Kiritsubo, was indeed astonishing. Because she was of such high birth, it may have been that people were imagining things, she seemed even more graceful and delicate than the other. No one could despise her for inferior rank, because Fujitsubo, Fujitsubo unlike Kiritsubo, is much high, comes from a much more prominent family. And the emperor need not feel shy about showing his love for her. The other lady had not particularly encouraged his attentions and had been the victim of a love too intense, like young Guifei. And now, though it would be wrong to say that she had quite forgotten her, sorry, that he had quite forgotten her, he found his affection shifting to the new lady who was a source of boundless comfort. So it is with the affairs of this world. Now, that might, I mean, that's kind of creepy enough to begin with the fact that, like, he, the emperor falls in love with Fujitsubo because she resembles Kiritsubo in so many ways. But also, this is sort of, here's the thing that you have to understand okay so because the emperor is infatuated was infatuated with kiritsubo it also means that he has a really 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 close relationship with genji her son and also his son to be perfectly honest and he definitely personally values genji more than any of his other children so as a result, Genji is always very close to the emperor. And it says that in the following paragraph. Since Genji never left his father's side, it was not easy for this new lady, the recipient of so many visits, to hide herself from him. This is highly unusual. The fact that Genji is around Fujitsubo so much and so often, particularly since she is essentially like, you know, the emperor's new wife, more or less. Like, that's weird. The other ladies were disinclined to think themselves her inferior, and indeed each of them had her own merits. They were all rather past their prime, however. Fujitsubo's beauty was of a younger and fresher sort, though in her childlike shyness she made an especial effort not to be seen, Genji occasionally caught a glimpse of her face. He could not remember his own mother, and it moved him deeply to learn from the lady who had first told the emperor of Fujitsubo that the resemblance was striking. He wanted to be near her always. So there's this weird sort of like, I mean, you can almost think of it in Freudian terms, although, you know, Freudian, Freud was not a thing at this time, obviously. Not until well into the 19th century. Um, where there's this sort of psychosexual relation where Genji sort of falls in love with Fujitsubo because he never knew his mother. And so there's like that transference of like, you know, the child desire for his mother onto this woman. But unlike sort of the the Freudian, like, psychodrama in which sort of you know the child desires their mother but is sort of like sexually frustrated because they can't have their mother. like in this case genji actually does form a sexual relationship with her and this is partially the emperor's fault because he actually encourages fujitsubo as we see in this paragraph to be more friendly with him and then it says in the following paragraph, Genji's affection for the new lady grew and the most ordinary flower or tinted leaf became the occasion for expressing it. Kokiden this woman, sort of the old crotchety old lady, was not pleased. She was not on good terms with Fujitsubo, because she wasn't on good terms with anybody, really. And all her old resentment at Genji came back. He was handsomer than the crown prince, her chief treasure in the world, well thought of by the whole court. 
people began calling Genji the Shining One. Fujitsubo ranked beside him, and the Emperor's affections became the Lady of the Radiant Sun. So we've already seen this doubling take place just right here in the first chapter from Kiritsubo to Fujitsubo. And in many ways, and Genji will become infatuated with Murasaki later when he meets her, precisely because she resembles Fujitsubo, who resembles Kiritsubo. But what's interesting is that there's, though there's this superficial resemblance between them, they're all very different women. They all have very different status. In fact, the character Murasaki's status in society is very similar to the author Murasaki's status in society. Fujitsubo is the daughter of um, an empress dowager, um, but Kiritsubo is, as we saw you know, in the very first paragraph, comes from fairly humble means. So they all have different statuses in society, even though they bear resemblances to each other. And also, um, Murasaki only really becomes involved with Genji. She has no relationship to the emperor. Um, the other interesting doubling is between Kokiden and Rokujo. So these are the, the other women in this case, um, but also very different. So in both of these cases, the, these, these become prototypes of the, the jealous woman, the woman who sort of um, makes other people's relationships difficult because of her own jealousies and her own problems in life. But um, Kokiden and Rokujo are very different kinds of women, even though they sort of both, serve, again, there's a superficial resemblance between them. Um, they serve similar functions in terms of like making other people's relationships difficult. Um, the Kokiden concert is just kind of a nasty older woman. Like she doesn't really have much of a personality to speak of. Rokujo is completely different because she is one of Genji's lovers. She's also older than Genji. And as I'll get to in the, um, the next video, there are a lot of sort of complications in her life that make her a far more interesting character than the Kokiden consort. And then also we have the relationship between Kiritsubo and Aoi, um, both. But what's interesting is that these two are actually, again, superficially similar in that they are sort of the, so Kiritsubo, like, oops. That's not good. Kiritsubo bears the emperor's son, which is Genji. Aoi bears Genji's son, who is um, Yugiri. But very different women. Aoi is not particularly beloved. Genji actually doesn't. I mean, she's his first wife. It's an arranged marriage. He doesn't particularly care for her all that much, even though they have a child together. Whereas Kiritsubo definitely was sort of the, the emperor's beloved. Um, the last doubling relationship that I want to talk about is this notion of the, the karmic bond. Which again, I don't think side sticker translates all that well. Uh, so on page 299, gotta scroll up a bit. It's the first page of the, the actual text that you guys have. It says right here. So this is again talking about the relationship between the emperor and Kiritsubo. And it says, it may have been because of a bond in a former life that she bore the emperor a beautiful son, a jewel beyond compare. Now, what's interesting about this is that here, karma is not this like supernatural like weight, the sort of pent up weight of one's sins or just sort of like, it's not the thing that sort of ties you to samsara as you know understood in traditional Buddhism, but actually karmic bonds in this text almost become a justification for one's romantic entanglements. In other words, it's not like, Oh, you know, you, you have to like get rid of your, you have to like sort of purge yourself of your, your karma. And then, you know, once the karmic cycle is finished, you'll finally achieve nirvana. That's not what this is referring to at all. Um, in many ways, it's saying like, oh, well, of course, those two people fell in love with each other because they must have been like lovers in a previous life or something, you know, silly like that. Something that really has nothing to do with Buddhism at all, properly understood. <clears throat> Also, the other major difference is that so these karmic bonds are actually seen as positive in the text and actually not something to be lamented or, or, or done away with. And again, this goes back to what I had talked about in um, earlier lectures about sort of the, the, the very different way in which Buddhism was understood by Japanese people in this period. All right, so then this leads us to an important question and one that scholars sort of wrestle with a lot, which is that Okay, so the, the, 
<laughs> the story is called the Genji Monogatari, the tale of Genji. But the question is, is it actually about Genji? Um, I guess in a superficial way, you could say, well, yeah. I mean, he is. He appears in every up until his death. He appears as a character in every single chapter, so he's there. But um, many scholars, myself included, would actually make the argument that Genji just kind of serves serves as a sort of a focus or like a center of gravity around whom various women orbit. And in fact, the text is far more interested in those women and the people who sort of surround Genji than it is in Genji himself. The female characters in the text are often far, are often have a far greater degree of psychological complexity. Um, the character of Genji himself is depicted as kind of just like wistful and carefree, often oblivious. Um, whereas the women have, you know, the full range of human emotions. Um, and also, you know, I'm less on board with, with this interpretation because oftentimes scholars will use the various women in the text as kind of like stand-ins for various aspects of the author herself. I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. I don't ever think it's a good idea to think of characters in a book as somehow like manifestations of personality traits or aspects of the person who wrote them. I mean, if you want to engage in that kind of speculation, fine. I just don't find it to be that useful. But yeah, in my personal opinion, and also, like I said, in the opinion of many others, like Genji pales in comparison as a character to the other, especially female characters in the text. And that as a woman, the, the author, Murasaki, potentially is writing about these other women as a way to kind of like shift the perspective. Instead of seeing, in fact, in many ways, she's trying to do the opposite of the song of everlasting sorrow. You know, this, this text that she her, herself is obsessed with, but she's doing, she's creating a kind of inversion of it rather than focusing on the emperor, his faults, and then sort of the, the historical events that proceed from his obsession. She's actually far more interested in the psychological state of someone like young Guifei. In other words, because Chinese literature and Chinese historical record don't particularly give a shit about Yang Guifei. Not I mean, like I said, outside of just like caricatures. Um, Murasaki definitely wants to deal with the sort of the psychological complexities of a woman like that and the position that she is put in rather than the position of sort of the, the man who is callous and indifferent and doesn't particularly like care about what's happening as a result of his actions. So then um, lastly, at least for this video, before um, <clears throat> I pause and move on, let's talk about Genji himself. So get my tea. The character's name is very weird. Um, it literally means, so, so the, the, the G in Genji, in fact, actually, maybe I should type this out. So that way, you know, those of you who can read Chinese characters will, will see what I mean. So that is how his name is written in Japanese. So the the she or G here means something like uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. So it's like, and then the, the character here, this is um, read Gen in this case, so Genji, but it could also be read as the, um, for the, the family, the Minamoto clan, which is a clan in which um, like scions of the imperial line who were turned into commoners would be sort of inducted into, it's sort of a artificial family. It's not really sort of, it's not like the Fujiwara where they sort of have historical origins and relations to other clans. This was a made up clan, more or less, in which um, like cast offs from the imperial line were deposited. And so his name in a weird sense almost kind of means like Mr. Minamoto. <laughs> Just, like I said, it's a weird name. Um, but what's important about this is that Genji is not of the royal line, um, though he is still the son of an emperor. And this sort of relationship, non-relationship, is actually the cause of a whole lot of problems later on in the, the story. Um, in addition to that, he's also kind of this, like as I said earlier, he's like this golden child. Everybody loves him. And you can see this on page 306 where 
Um, so after his mother dies, he is staying with his his grandparents, the parents of his mother, and the but the emperor wants to bring the boy back to court. And when he comes back to court, even um, the Kukiden consort like melts a little bit. Um, it says he now lived at court. When he was seven, he went through the ceremonial reading of the Chinese classics. Never before had there been so fine a performance. He's the best. He's the smartest. He's the prettiest. He's the tallest. He's just the best. <laughs> he's the best at everything. Everybody loves him. He's, he's fantastic. Which is interesting because despite being the best, being every, the, the guy that everybody loves, um, what the, this story, the story of Genji, in many ways, focuses on his faults. So something to bear in mind. Again, a tremor of apprehension passed over the emperor. Might it be that such a prodigy was not to be long for this world? He's just too special for this world. Quote, no one need be angry with him now that his mother is gone. He took the boy to visit the Kokiden Pavilion. And now, most especially, I hope you will be kind to him. And again, so she, he's brought into the, the, the Kokiden Hall, the Kokiden. Admitting the boy to her inner chambers, even Kokiden was pleased. Not the sternest of warriors or the most unbending of enemies could have held back a smile. Kokiden was reluctant to let him go. She had two daughters, but neither could compare with him in beauty. The lesser ladies crowded about, not in the least ashamed to show their faces, all eager to amuse him, though aware that he set them off to disadvantage. I need not speak of his accomplishments in the compulsory subjects, the classics, and the like. When it comes to music, his flute and koto made the heavens echo, but to recount all his virtues, I fear would I fear give rise to a suspicion that I just wrote the truth. Oh, actually, oh, I, I kind of looked for this passage and I thought Side Sacred left it out. I guess it's, it's tacked on to another paragraph. That's weird. Um, so here we see this, this idea that sort of the author is sort of self-conscious about the way in which she is representing things. And she wants to present herself as someone who's, you know, presenting an accurate record of this fictional character. Um, the last thing we want to know about Genji is this, this epithet that he acquires, Hikaru Genji. And I note that right here, the Shining Genji, and you see this on page 310. Well, actually, it starts on the bottom of 309. The minister selected the handsomest and most accomplished of ladies to wait upon the young pair, that is Genji and his new wife, Aoi, um, who is the daughter of the minister of the left, I believe, if I remember correctly. Sorry, that's off the top of my head. Again, no name. He's just the minister of the left. <laughs> uh, the young parent planned the sort of diversions that were most likely to interest Genji. At the palace, the emperor assigned him the apartments that had been his mother's and took care that her retinue was not dispersed. Orders were handed down to the offices of repairs and fittings to remodel the house that had belonged to the lady's family. The results were magnificent. The plantings and the artificial hills had always been remarkably tasteful, and the grounds now swarmed with workmen widening the lake. If only, thought Genji, he could have with him the lady he yearned for, Fujitsubo. So he marries this woman, Aoi, but he's, he's still got the hots for Fujitsubo. The sobriquet, the shining Genji one hears, was bestowed upon him by the Korean. So the Korean here, this is earlier in the chapter, there's this Korean who like reads him his fortune and says that, oh, he's going to be, he's going to be so superior in everything and apps, he's going to be the best. Um, but all of that will sort of bring nothing but sorrow and, and ruin. It won't come to a good end. And well, I mean, the Korean's kind of wrong, but for various reasons, um, we're not going to get into anyway. So let me turn off my screen share for a second, come back to you guys. So um, that's it for um, the first chapter we're going to be talking about this week. Um, I'm going to take a bit of a break, and then afterwards, I will go to the second chapter we'll be talking about for this week, which is Aoi. See you in a bit.